Welcome to Declassifying the Paranormal. Here we reveal the secrets that sinister organizations attempt to conceal from the world, objects and entities that could shake the very foundations of what we think is, and is not, possible. Today we have secured documents belonging to the SCP Foundation, and will reveal to you the nature of SCP-6003. Item Number 6003 Containment Class Pending Special Containment Procedures Foundation Facility Site Null has been constructed above sea level, 5.5 km west from SCP-6003's shoreline, for the purposes of observation, research, and containment of anomalous phenomena related to the island. SCP-6003's secluded nature is considered sufficient self-containment. In the event of trespassing, individuals are to be detained, and amnestics administered at the discretion of the acting site director. Update, March 14, 1969 Due to the events of Incident 6003-Kurban, all activity on SCP-6003 must be conducted with the use of protective ACAD, anomalous corrosion and degradation, suits engineered to prevent chemical breakdown. Upon conclusion of activities, Personnel returning to Site Null are to be quarantined inside an ultra-sterile chamber until biological testing indicates that the party is absent of SCP-6003's effects. Suits are then to be incinerated. Description SCP-6003 is an island in the Pacific Ocean, located inside an extra-dimensional pocket at geolocational coordinates 58 degrees 33 minutes and 31.0 seconds north 20 degrees 57 minutes and 57.0 seconds east, inaccessible to individuals who do not meet a set of criteria. Access to SCP-6003 is limited to those with knowledge of the island and or its coordinates. Travel via sea with the intention of reaching SCP-6003, even without adequate nautical navigational expertise or familiarity with SCP-6003's coordinates, will result in the journeying party locating the island through a poorly understood, non-Euclidean shift between two points. After a duration of ordinary travel, ranging from 45 minutes to 8 hours, individuals have reported navigational instruments ceasing function and their vessels briefly entering a blanket of fog before emerging 10 kilometers from the island's shoreline. This phenomenon occurs regardless of SCP-6003's proximity to the individual's departure location and does not apply to individuals traveling by aerial locomotion. The only naturally occurring life forms on SCP-6003 are plants, a variety of which are unique to SCP-6003 and SCP-6003-1. SCP-6003-1 is a 50-meter tall, smooth, wooden pillar at the center of SCP-6003, taking the form of an early 1940s lighthouse. SCP-6003-1 is not in an operational state. SCP-6003-1 appears to be one solid piece of hollowed wood, with the topmost section carved into a lantern pane. An entrance into SCP-6003-1 has yet to be discovered, and the structure has proven to be resistant to force during attempts to access its interior. The base is embedded at least 15 meters into the earth and much of the surrounding soil swells, similar to tree roots, around SCP-6003-1, however no analogous structures have been discovered. Radiocarbon dating of SCP-6003-1 has returned incongruent results, ranging from 12,000 BCE to three years prior to discovery. Previous signs of habitation exist on SCP-6003, including elaborate ruins, written records, sophisticated technology, and personal effects. Radiocarbon dating and anthropological analysis has determined the civilization that once inhabited SCP-6003 to be upwards of 2,000 years old. No supplementary evidence corroborating the existence of this civilization has been found in historical documents, anomalous or otherwise. Likewise, no discernible evidence of trade is recorded in writings recovered from SCP-6003. Despite this, Numerous objects and resources recovered from the island, such as cloths, tools, statues, and lodgings, are composed of materials not naturally occurring on SCP-6003 itself, 
their origin of acquisition remaining unknown. At present, no physical remains have been excavated from SCP-6003. Addendum 6003.1 Recovered Materials SCP-6003 came to the attention of the Foundation upon the passing of 05-6 on April 3, 1968. Among their personal possessions entrusted to the Foundation for further research was a manuscript, heavily water-damaged and presumably cut from a larger work. The origin of this text remains unknown. It has been reproduced below. And he said unto Lothos, Traverse the seas, the waters of the world, though come not to that place. Craft from night and bound at hate, a paradise lived alone. His meager kingdom ever still, beneath the wooded throne. Where harrowed silence permeates, no reverence maintained. A quiet corner undisturbed, the sleeping giant remains. Von Taya took heed of her master's warning, and wept. Additionally, a document containing the aforementioned coordinates derived from the above passage using numerology, was also entrusted to the Foundation's care. An exploration party was commissioned by the Foundation and made landfall upon SCP-6003 on August 29, 1968. Addendum 6003.2 Initial Exploration and Discoveries on August 29, 1968, members of Mobile Task Force SATA-67, Anchors Away, and Foundation researchers Thomas Swain, Emily Clark, and Rosa Hamm, were deployed to SCP-6003 for a preliminary exploration. Swain, the research team's head, was instructed to maintain a journal of his thoughts and discoveries. Excerpt from Thomas Swain's Personal Log August 29, 1968 When the Foundation sends us out, they usually want something in particular. A captured anomaly, a person of interest, something. Getting sent out for preliminary exploration, on the other hand, makes you feel like a ball in a pachinko machine. They're just dropping us and seeing where we land. This time around, we didn't get any concrete instructions other than doing a clean sweep of the place and making sure that everyone gets out in one piece. There was always a chance that those would be at odds with each other, but the higher-ups never were revered for their communication skills. Past the initial shore, there's a ring of craggy, silt-laden plains. A brief trek through the sediment, and we came into a grassy, lush valley. The change in scenery was jarring but considering the circumstances of our arrival, it wasn't unbelievable, just nonsensical. Then there were the ruins. Lots of them, laid throughout the valley clearing as far as the eye could see. Each building was one long room assorted into horizontal sections. Well, diagonal columns. The thing was that each room was slightly more elevated than the one before it, like a massive, circular staircase. You know the Colosseum? Picture that, but gray, falling apart due to hundreds of years of natural decay, and a thousand times bigger. Transcript Source, footage captured from Thomas Swain's body camera. Date, August 29, 1968 Begin log Multiple segments of ruins are present as Swain navigates through their perimeter. Other members of the preliminary research team aren't visible, but Rosa Ham's voice is audibly distant. Swain approaches a ruined building composed of what appears to be sandstone near the center of a segment. The ruin is significantly wider than normal, spanning two sections. On the right side of the entrance is a featureless stone pillar, extending to shoulder height. The top edge of the pillar appears significantly more worn than the surrounding structure, as if it's been touched by many hands. Swain enters the ruin. I'm seeing a few similarities to the structure of the settlement present here. There's rows of what I assume to be stone benches, and again they're getting progressively taller. These ones look like they're in actual rows though. My best guess is that this was some sort of communal space but we might need a better understanding of the culture here before we can say for sure. Especially if we want to claim that. Swain stumbles slightly before catching himself. A stone cylinder, broken less than two inches above its base, is sticking out of the ground. What, why is that there? 
As Swain crouches down to inspect the cylinder, a second stone cylinder is visible between two benches. It has been broken at one end and has a prism embedded in the stone at the other end. Swain retrieves the second cylinder. It doesn't fit perfectly with the bit in the ground, probably because there's some smaller pieces that went missing. Here, let me just... Swain supports the cylinder with one hand. He shines his flashlight at the prism, the beam diffracting into smaller beams and creating a band of light at around chest height. Pause, interesting. A primitive light source, looks like. If sunlight got in here. Yeah, this thing could light up an entire room. Swain sets the cylinder down and approaches the back wall of the ruin through an antechamber. Six haphazardly carved pillars are situated within. The first five have a wooden box on top of them, however the last pillar is coated in a thick, stone-like substance which renders its box fully concealed, if one is present. This hole, I'm trying to make sense of this, but everything is either too ancient or in. Complete shambles. Look at this. Swain opens the first box, coughing as a current of dust shoots out as the lid is lifted. He finds a large stone with a crude painting drawn on it. I don't even know what I'm supposed to be looking at here. A piece of a mural. It's too damaged to make out the image. There's five, four more of these we can get to. If we're lucky, we might have a better idea of what we're looking at by the time higher-ups get a hold of this footage. Let's get some close shots of these. Body camera is close to the back wall of the ruin while the sound of a camera shutter can be heard. Swain inspects approximately two-thirds of the back wall in this manner before stopping and turning to face the entrance. SCP-6003-1 is visible in the distance. Swain's breath is audibly lighter as he rests on the nearest stone bench. Body camera continues to face the entrance. Swain is motionless for several minutes, occasionally mumbling to himself. Over Swain's handheld receiver, Rosa and I finished encircling the ruins. Over. Hum? I was. Can you, would you mind repeating that one more time for me? Over. The ruins are laid out in a circular formation around the whole island. We just went around the entirety of it. Then a try and see what's in the middle. Over. Sounds good. I'll start making my way there. Over. End log. Afterward, as of this file's previous revision, November 15, 1977, no close inspection of the remaining one-third of the ruins have been conducted, as environmental conditions on SCP-6003, see preceding addenda for details have inhibited further investigation. Excerpt from Thomas Swain's Personal Log, Hunt August 29, 1968 The outermost rooms had what may have once been 40 centimeters or so of steps, while the innermost ones were stone roofs poking out of the dirt. The low-laying buildings we could access had stairs leading down, so it's clear that they were supposed to be at least partially below ground. Details that would give us a clue as to what happened to the people who once lived here had broken down into nothing useful. If whoever lived here had doors, they had all disappeared by the time we arrived. What's more, the plants had moved in while they were gone. The grass was halfway up our boots and Rosa almost tripped over some of the vines. Twice. The clovers were relatively tame. The front of each ruin always had a gap where a door might have been with no openings anywhere except, occasionally, the back. Eventually, Rosa pointed out that the houses near the back of each segment were wider than the ones in the front. They weren't in a perfect grid, they were all angled slightly so that the sections pointed towards a single area. We only looked at a few buildings, and anything beyond that had been hiding in the fog, so we decided to walk around and figure out how wide the fan of ruins was. M went to the back of one building, Rosa went to the end of another, and they were planning to walk along by the outermost ruins in opposite directions until they reached opposite ends. Instead, they met on the other side. Since the ruins formed a giant ring, we decided to see what was in the middle, 
the fog was too thick for our flashlights to be worth a damn, so they had to get close to figure out what was there. They didn't have to finish walking to realize it was a lighthouse. A towering monolith, jutting into the sky like the base of a great tree. It dwarfed the surrounding ruins, yet none of us noticed the structure until we approached the island center. Now, it was impossible to miss. The tower was crafted from some type of wood. None of us, nor our equipment, could figure out what kind. It was gray, incredibly smooth at first glance, but the fine details revealed twists and curves in the surface as if they were sculpted by expert hands. It was as breathtaking as it was terrifying. No power source, no entrance, but nonetheless, the giant stood an undeniable testament that something had been here before us. To think that we failed to notice something that commanded such a presence carried another unsettling implication. Addendum 6003.3 Further Findings On September 4, 1968, Excavation Site C, established in the innermost circle of ruins in an area believed to hold hierarchical significance due to its size, sophistication, and the presence of a throne, located a previously unnoticed passageway behind a large, circular sculpture that hung on a wall. The tunnel led to an ornate antechamber, decorated with intricate, lined patterns and complex tapestries on its walls. Beyond this vestibule was a larger room, similar in design, where six rectangular stone boxes were situated. These boxes held pieces of painted stone which were in a state where their contents could be discerned. It is believed that they are similar to the largely incomprehensible mural pieces found during SCP-6003's initial ground exploration. A visual analysis by researcher Ham has been included below. Box 1, a person coated in heavy, black furs, possibly a humanoid primate, is shown standing on an empty patch of land with their arms outstretched. In front of them a tree highlighted by a yellow flash of light can be seen contorting and changing its shape. Box 2 depicts two long ships making port at the northern edge of an island. At the island center is SCP-6003-1. Its lantern appears to be operational. Positioned near the structure is a skeleton, presumably belonging to the figure in Box 1. Box 3 A human figure, drawn with golden paint most likely the tribe's leader or figure of social importance, is in front of SCP-6003-1, arms outstretched in a position similar to the first mural. A beam of light is pointed at them. Box 4, SCP-6003-1 is surrounded by trees, animals, overgrown grass, and food. Members of the tribe are kneeling to it and the leader, who is situated in front of SCP-6003-1 now depicted as having a gray crown on their head. Box 5 Front Drawing of the ruins surrounding SCP-6003-1 are now present. The leader is depicted praying to SCP-6003-1 as the rest of the tribe are doing various tasks such as farming, conversing, or dancing. Box 5 Back The tribe surrounds SCP-6003-1. Their faces are weeping, solemn or distressed. The leader is seen in front of or embedded into SCP-6003-1. Beams of light are shining from them. There is substantially more overgrowth in the background. Box 6. Inaccessible, coated in a gray material covered in a viscous, sap-like substance that has been resistant to all attempts at removal. Interview The following document has been released at the interviewee's personal request. Readers are reminded that any claims made in this document have not been verified or endorsed by the SCP Foundation. Request for Project Transfer Interviewer, Dr. Thomas Swain Interviewed, Researcher Rosa Hamm Begin log at 823 Well I haven't been to the Grand Canyon, but I don't understand why you're asking me about it. But have you seen the Grand Canyon? I've seen photos of it, if that's what you were asking. Then you've seen how time lays on something. You've seen how it wears down the world. It carves the land. It carves buildings. Hell, it carves people. Sure. 
Most of that lighthouse is a wood cylinder. It's like a tree, except for the fact that trees have age. They have holes where beetles dug into their bark and scorch marks from old fires. That lighthouse was smooth. The damn thing hasn't been touched. And it doesn't have any actual roots either, because that would imply some sort of change. It would mean that the lighthouse interacted with the rest of the landscape. But the lighthouse and the landscape are completely independent. Well, sure. I imagine that it being made of exceptionally strong wood is a part of the anomaly. This is more than just strong wood. Living things age. Dead things decay. This does neither. It might as well be nothing. I touched it, I put my weight on it, and I'm still not sure that it even exists. Whether or not you're correct, we need to conduct more research. Research on what? A small society lives on an island that's nowhere next to a pillar of nothing before disappearing without a trace. You saw those rocks like I did. They weren't made for art. They were made to tell people something. I'm aware of that, Rosa. That's exactly why we need to do more research. You can do your research on your own, I don't want to end up wherever the hell they went. We don't know if they went anywhere. Like you said, things decay and die. This place is ancient, Rosa, and we need to look into every corner before we make any assumptions. I'm not going to be here for that. I know when something's wrong. You know it too, and why you're going to these lengths to ignore it is beyond me. Listen, to be eligible for a transfer you need to. When I was sent here, to conduct preliminary exploration only mind you, not any of that sight null death trap you've been going forward with, we were instructed to keep everyone alive. This is me keeping everyone alive. Is that eligible enough for you? Unless you can prove that you are at some sort of elevated risk, I can't approve you for a transfer. My God, you were there. You looked at the lighthouse. You looked at those rocks. What did you see? A pause. I saw people, Rosa. People who obsessed over something they couldn't understand. Remainder of log excluded as per interviewee's request. Following a discussion with the other site staff, researcher Ham's request for transfer was ultimately approved by head researcher Swain, and she was moved off of the project. Despite Ham's account, other station researchers and task force members have not displayed any ill effects or a desire to leave the SCP-6003 project. Addendum 6003.4 Site Null Development on Site Null was completed on September 28, 1968, officially establishing Site Null as a secure facility. Excerpt from Secure Facility Dossier Site Null Site Null is a fixed platform, built on eight steel leg supports that have been anchored into the seabed five kilometers from the coast of SCP-6003. A crew of 16 personnel sourced from the initial exploration team and the Foundation's archaeology department have been allocated to Site Null. The team's lead, Thomas Swain, was appointed site director, with Emily Clark heading the research department responsible for analyzing phenomena related to SCP-6003. Site Null's primary directive is to function in conjunction with archaeological operations conducted on SCP-6003. Six excavation sites have been established across the island in areas that personnel believe will yield results in the recovery of materials belonging to SCP-6003's previous inhabitants. Between October 1 and October 10, 1968, a number of staff situated at Site Null reported numerous anomalous events. Interviews with affected staff allowed for the creation of the following file. Seagulls are repeatedly spotted circling above Site Null. Despite there being no recorded deviance from typical seagull appearance and behavior, they are repeatedly described as vulture-like. As SCP-6003 lacks natural fauna, it is unknown how these animals have reached the island's locus. A rogue wave formed unusually close to land, colliding with Site Null. Three personnel are injured. Water faucets at Site Null have repeatedly dispensed human blood. Chemical analysis of the fluid indicated it had been heavily diluted with seawater. 
multiple radio frequencies used in site null operations were simultaneously disrupted. Personnel using disrupted channels reported hearing multiple voices conversing in an unknown language. Plant growth in ruins has anomalously accelerated, leading to the entrapment of two excavating personnel for several hours. Team was recovered successfully. Fog density near SCP-6003 shoreline has greatly increased. Personnel are advised to exercise extreme caution to avoid running Foundation ships aground. Transmissions consisting of heavy breathing and a wet, shifting noise were intercepted by Site Null nightly for two weeks. These messages were determined to originate from SCP-6003. A team surveying SCP-6003's mountains reported seeing a massive, decaying tree, lined with human eyes that, when approached, collapsed to the ground with a loud cry before disappearing. Two personnel who were fishing off-site Null's dock for recreational purposes reeled in a wicker basket that was sealed at the middle, with several holes punched in its top half. When separated, various cloths and a small piece of bark, engraved with a symbol of unknown significance, were found inside. Personnel at Excavation Site D, while underground, reported hearing jovial sounds coming from the surface and seeing dancing silhouettes flicker on the walls as if cast by a flame. Sounds were described as fleeting, and recalling the experience caused personnel emotional distress, often to the point of tears. MTF Captain, Rianne Langley, refused to emerge from her quarters for three days, citing a claim that SCP-6003-1 was watching and judging her. On the fourth day, Langley suffered short-term memory loss and could not recall the events of the past week. She has since been relieved of her duty at Site Null. An archaeological team of four was observed standing in front of SCP-6003-1 for eight hours each individual situated in one of the four cardinal directions around the pillar. When questioned, personnel did not view their actions as abnormal. Site Null observed a passing vessel on the horizon, described as a longship made from black, curved wood. The ship's bow held up a large figurehead of what appeared to be the head of an ape, with its mouth held open and its eyes replaced with stones. The vessel passed within 10 minutes, undetected by the site's radar. Personnel report feelings of constantly being observed at Site Null and on SCP-6003. Dr. Emily Clark is overcome with a fit of mania, fully convinced she is suffering an eternal punishment in the afterlife. She repeatedly cried out that vines were constraining her and pulling her into the ground. After several hours, Clark regained her composure. Noted distress has been observed in her demeanor since, though she has passed all subsequent psychological assessment tests. Several personnel stationed on SCP-6003 reported seeing holes in the ground, with large, human eyes embedded into the earth. They are described as crying. A single 20 seconds transmission is intercepted by Site Null, consisting of screaming. The message was determined to be sent from SCP-6003. Personnel testing SCP-6003-1's chemical composition experience minor ground tremors, localized to the area immediately surrounding the pillar. All personnel reported the sensation of hands grabbing onto their lower bodies and pulling. Paul Chandler, site staff, received medical attention after collapsing in the field. After a prolonged struggle in which he claimed his body was being pierced in multiple locations, he expired. Autopsy revealed his nervous system had been replaced with fibrous tree roots, resulting in heavy damage to the his internal physiology. On October 10, 1968, SCP-6003's anomalous weather formation of fog is disrupted for the first time as a storm takes the island. This event is yet to subside. All activity has been relegated to site null until further notice. The catalyst for these events is unknown and under investigation. Addendum 6003.5 Analysis of SCP-6003-1 Primary bases of operation were erected following Site Null's creation. These outposts were located on the far east and west ends of the ruins. During that time, SCP-6003-1 became a point of focus for Director Swain.
Site 322's Joseph Log, an expert on anomalous ruins and structures, was asked to examine SCP-6003-1. Present members Thomas Swain Joseph Log Source, footage captured from Thomas Swain's body camera Date, October 15, 1968 Begin Log Personnel are standing a few meters from the base of SCP-6003-1. Sounds of the storm that has enveloped the island are heard throughout the recording. Wood, right. Yup, petrified wood. It's been resistant to all of our attempts at entry. Chances are that whatever petrified this made it anomalously resilient too. I've heard that they petrify the shelves in the Wanderer's Library, but those shelves had color. They weren't. This. The gray is striking. Very striking. I don't think this came from the Wanderer's Library. It's too attention grabbing. It was probably more of a beacon for those who lived here than anything else, so it's possible they built it. We haven't seen any evidence for that yet. We are under the belief they. They built around it. That's probably the case. But it could also be possible that their leader summoned it. There are carvings, we're still going through them. Seems like they praised it. Almost as if they were brought here because of it, or at least something relating to it. So it's an icon. A great one too. Any evidence of this being a structure to honor the dead? Not exactly. I'll get back to you when I can do some more research. Thank you. A brief pause. Really makes you feel small, doesn't it? Yeah, I guess it does. I didn't really think about it until you said so. I think it was meant for something or someone. I wonder if they ever saw it. Faint rumbling is heard. The fog above the two personnel is illuminated by a blinding white light, which slowly begins to spin. Dr. Log leaves Swain, who is staring at the light. Log approaches the base of SCP-6003-1. Oh. I, it hasn't done that yet. Tom, come here. Look at this. Yeah? The grass surrounding SCP-6003 is fading in color slowly turning from a vivid green to a muted gray. I don't understand. I'm grabbing a sample. Dr. Log reaches for a reed of grass. When his fingers touch it, the plant crumbles into ash. End Log Afterward, SCP-6003-1's lantern has remained constantly active since this event. Over the preceding five days, the discoloration of plant life spread at an approximate speed of 0.5 meters per hour. This rate slowly accelerated over the course of another week at a constant rate. The recovered substance from Dr. Log found that the grass reed was being destroyed on a molecular level. Its cells were still intact, however in stasis and inert. Containment efforts began following this discovery. Partial Containment Log Proposed Containment Effort Ignite affected plant life through use of controlled burns to limit the spread of anomalous discoloration. Result Ineffective The spread continued accelerating through the burned plant life. Proposed Containment Effort Clear the island of all personnel. Result Ineffective the discoloration continued through the island, spreading throughout the ruins and foundation outposts. Proposed containment effort Decommissioning of SCP-6003-1 A nuclear explosive would be detonated on SCP-6003, at the base of SCP-6003-1. Result Denied by Deer, Swain Researchers are currently searching for a cause for this incident. At the present moment, the spread has ceased at the edges of the island. MTF Zeta-67, anchors away, was deployed for an exploration of SCP-6003 in an effort to assess any potential damage.
team members were outfitted with standard hazardous environment equipment along with body cameras. Addendum 6003.6 Mobile Task Force Investigation Close Mission Transcript Present Members Dr. Thomas Swain, Remote Commander Zeta-67 White, Captain Zeta-67 Mako Zeta-67 Blue Source, footage compiled from Zeta-67's body cameras Date, October 20, 1968 Begin Log We've landed There is a light cracking sound with each step the members take, as well as rainfall Occasionally, the sound of thunder can be heard. It feels like I'm stepping in snow. Is this grass? It was. Through the fog, SCP-6003-1 slide can be seen spinning in the distance, briefly illuminating the distant ruins and the team members. Proceed to the ruins. There's a section of the main building we weren't able to access previously. Copy that. Beginning approach now. Blue slides his hand along the outer walls of a building. It flakes off. Are we at risk for structural collapse in here? I could tear a piece out if I tried hard enough. It's possible that enough force may cause a chain collapse. Proceed in and don't lean on anything. The room we're looking for is located through that northernmost antechamber. Understood. The team proceeds. Grabbing a sample. Pause. This is so odd. The Amako peels a layer of the cobblestone flooring. It's like dry sand. Or chalk. Command is there anywhere else we need. All members pause, then quickly cup their hands over their ears. Silence save for the rain, for ten seconds. Status report, White. Do you copy? Command is ignored. What the hell was that? No clue. Zeta Mako shudders. Where did that come from? Mako, you alright? Yeah, yeah, I'm fine. Explain, White. Oh, I read you. Did the mic not pick it up? What, did you hear something? Yeah, it was like stone scraping on stone. Nails on a chalkboard. SCP-6003-1's light passes through the windows of the building, briefly illuminating the team. We'll check through the recording when we get back. Permission to proceed, command? Granted. Theta-67 passes through the antechamber and into a room where six pillars are seen. The sixth one is coated in a calcified, stone-like material. At your three near the eastern wall. Sixth pillar. Roger. Data Blue breaks away. He approaches the western wall and begins inspecting the first box. This one? Yes. We believe there is one more inscription somewhere in that wall. Use your knives, scrape against the wall and find it. Roger. Roger. Beginning now. Zeta White and Zeta Mako begin removing sections of the coating. Where the hell is Blue? Huh? Command, can you repeat the question? Your third teammate, Blue, where is he? Who? It's only us here, sir. Is everything alright? What are you? I got something. A partial stone box is seen on Zeta Mako's body camera. I continue, please. Zeta Mako and Zeta White begin pulling from the same area. Blue, do you copy? And he said unto Lothos, traverse the seas, the waters of the world. Blue? Blue, I hear you. Do you copy? Please return to your team. Though come not to that place. Craft from night and bounded hate. Blue, this is Tom Swain. You're disregarding my orders. A paradise lived alone. Zeta Mako and Zeta White begin scraping at a much faster pace. Mako? White? Intervene, now. 
We're almost done here. His meager kingdom ever still, beneath the wooded throne. That's a goddamn order, Mako. Your teammate is in distress. Where harrowed silence permeates. Approximately half of the stone box is now revealed. No reverence maintained. White? White? White do you copy? A quiet corner undisturbed, the sleeping. I copy, sir. Zeta Mako and Zeta White increase their speed. Do you hear me, goddammit? Blue get back to your team, now. Giant remains. Loud and clear. We're almost done here. Goddammit, Blue, Anthony, listen to me. You're going to be alright. Montaya took heed of her master's warning. The box is revealed. And wept. Did a white prize the box open inside of it is another decorated stone? It depicts members of the civilization lined up outside of SCP-6003-1. The ones closest to it appear to be entering it. Blue? Zeta White turns around, finding Zeta Blue completely still. Blue? Oh God, Blue? Oh no. Zeta Blue's body becomes duller, as if all the color is being sucked out of him by an unknown force. Within seven seconds, Zeta Blue is completely colorless. Starting at the base of his feet, the matter comprising the body takes on a chalky, flaky appearance. This deterioration climbs slowly up his body, until the entirety of it is transfigured into the substance. Hello? White do you copy? Mako? Zeta White approaches Zeta Blue and places a hand on his shoulder. The body collapses into a mound of ash. See, copy. Mako? Hello? Zeta White turns back to Mako, who is now undergoing the degradation. She is suffering in the final stages of the conversion before Zeta Mako collapses. Oh God. End log. SCP-6003 remains evacuated. Site Null is currently operating through remote containment procedures. Personnel are no longer permitted to travel to SCP-6003. Addendum 6003.7 Recovered materials from Director Thomas Swain On October 23, 1968, three days after the Mobile Task Force mission, Director Swain was discovered to be missing, leading to Dr. Clark being designated as a temporary site director. An investigation ensued, however, the causal factors of this event still remain unknown. During said investigation, a number of journal entries beginning after Rosa Ham's dismissal, as well as multiple requests for additional personnel from Swain, were discovered. They are presented chronologically below. Recovered Materials May 9, 1968 I can't believe I let Rosa walk like that. She was a good researcher, one with skill and potential. I think she knew that though, and perhaps that scared her. Well, something scared her. There's nothing on this island, nothing I can look at and feel frightened by. It's peaceful, there's a calm stillness not found elsewhere, especially in my line of work. I looked at everything she did and felt the opposite. Maybe it's me who's blind to it all. Maybe there is something so vivid and so intense that my brain rolls over it. Rosa would be smart then, and I'd be the fool. I examined the same rocks she did and understood the same thing she had. What am I missing? There were people here once. They lived here, they worshipped a god who provided for them, a god who is now defunct, as are they. I guess I should have fought harder to keep her. Maybe I'd understand what she was so adamant about. Maybe I'd listen. Date, May 8, 1968 Request for Additional Personnel Notes Researcher Rosa Ham, Level 3, has been transferred to another project. Replacement needed. Status, denied. Date, October 4, 1968 Request for additional personnel. Notes Anomalous activity has disrupted our team, which was a skeleton crew to begin with. 
Lots of people have been working overtime, but the lack of sleep is starting to get to all of us. Additionally, prior requests for additional personnel have yet to be addressed. A transfer is sorely needed. Status Denied October 10, 1968 Emily had a breakdown earlier today. She kept begging me to forgive her. I'm losing my grip on this position. Nothing really prepares a person for something like this, to have everyone's lives and well-being placed in my hands, only for them to slip through my fingers drip by drip. Emily kept babbling about falling and a snake wrapping around her and squeezing her. I gathered everyone up after we had Emily sedated. We tried to think of answer but no one had anything. I told them that the lighthouse had turned on and they looked at me like I was crazy. No one else saw it, apparently. I showed them the video and they asked me where it was filmed. No one could find Joseph either. The meeting went nowhere. Joseph thinks we triggered when we were forming the dig sites. We are looking into that whenever we can get to the island. The only consensus I can get is that we all feel like there's something or someone two inches behind us, but every time we turn around they're gone. Like we're stuck in a dream unable to run away from the nightmare that's slowly gaining on us. I need more people. I need someone to help us stay sane and work through this. October 22, 1968 I sent our only protection to die today. I can't figure out if I'm to blame or the lighthouse. They'll never believe me when I say it. It's still watching me as I write this. Emily says I'm paranoid and that we're safe here. Are we safe anywhere near this God-forsaken place? I had to abandon my men and they were rendered to chalk. To ash. To nothing. Date, October 22, 1968 Request for additional personnel. Notes We're all cramped on the oil rig and burnt out as hell. Sarah Huxley's femur was broken by the rogue wave from a few weeks ago and she still isn't ready to work again. I don't know if Rosa has been talking to whoever is in charge of the transfers, but she wasn't in any real danger. I only let her transfer because I realized she was too out of her mind to get any work done if she had stayed. Our only task force agents are gone. We're hardly able to step on that island without more manpower. Until then, you're putting our lives at risk. Status Denied Date October 23, 1968 Request for Additional Personnel Notes Do you know what it's like over here? Do you know that the non-essential personnel I dismissed was just Sarah? who was hopped up on so much OxyContin she couldn't tell up from down? In case you haven't been sticking hidden microphones everywhere, here's your fucking site dossier. Site Null is an oil rig gone to shit. The level 5 stopped letting anyone into the site after Rosa Ham ran her mouth off to them. Fuck whoever was already working there, I guess. Researchers are getting injured? Anomaly is becoming more and more dangerous. Not a problem. While higher-ups were busy sitting on their hands, all personnel at Site Null were transformed into feral and burnt-out creatures, working 100-hour weeks and drinking more espresso than water. Site Director Thomas Swain can be found in his quarters working, eating, or sleeping. He keeps the door locked in case the rest of the team stages a mutiny, which should happen pretty soon. He predicts that if no additional personnel are transferred, the insurgency or the serpents or Anderson or whoever the hell needs people familiar with anomalies is going to get some new recruits within the next few months. Or maybe they'll all be dead. We need more personnel. This isn't a request, it's a demand. Status, pending. I don't know what else to do. The following night. Site Null surveillance drones alerted Site Command that an unknown person had landed on SCP-6003. An attempt to contact this person via the pre-existing outposts failed on account of the decay and weather conditions by the persisting storm. After 12 minutes, this person remotely connected with Site Command on their own accord via a body camera. Close file. Source. Footage captured from Thomas Swain's body camera.
Update, October 25, 1968 Begin log Dear Swain is standing in front of SCP-6003-1 The sounds of the storm drown out the sound of his microphone, adding significant feedback to his responses. What the hell are you doing? I'm sorry. I had to see it. Tom, get back here, now. This is extremely dangerous. Ham was right. She was right about it all. They went in there. I don't know why. Maybe it wanted them to. Maybe it told them. They loved it, though. The camera pans up. SCP-6003-1's beam can be seen rotating. Swain remains silent on this image for 3 minutes and 32 seconds. Clark's attempts to converse with Swain are fruitless and have been expunged from this record for brevity. I think about it a lot. We have these plants, completely unnatural to this world, and these ruins, an unnatural addition to this island. You know what was always here though. This was. It's the only thing watching this island, watching us. Camera pans back to the front. SCP-6003-1's beam appears to pause. The camera feed is overexposed. The people who were here figured that out too. They knew it was only safe in there. Loud scraping is heard. You just have to understand that. The feed is now visible again. A large gap is seen in SCP-6003-1's walls. The interior is pitch black. Then, it will accept you. Swain enters. The feed goes to static for three seconds. I knew it. Swain is now standing on a barren field. Snow or ash is raining from above him. The entirety of the expanse is in grayscale. Swain begins to pace forward silently, following multiple sets of footsteps. They left a path for us. Fourteen minutes redacted for brevity, Swain intermittently recites the passage from Addendum.6003.1 to himself quietly. Approximately five meters in front of Swain is what appears to be a massive tangle of vines and roots. They are a vivid brown in color. It all makes sense, the poem, it was right. I thought it was a warning, I really did. Swain is now standing close to the colossal bundle of roots. At least 200 corpses are entwined within it, dressed similarly. They can all be seen slowly exhaling and inhaling in unison. Comparison of footage showed that their breathing pattern corresponded to each rotation of SCP-6003-1's lantern. Three bodies are noticed closer to the outside than the others. Swain approaches them. While their clothes are identical to the other corpses, they are all bearing the insignia of MTF Zeta-67 on their right biceps. It wasn't. It really wasn't. It wouldn't let anything else die on its watch. It stopped death. It conquered death. Swain begins to cry, that's why it took the island back and took our agents, it's, it's saving them. We woke it up and, and it wants to save me. I understand. Anything's better than the expanse and not knowing the struggle. And for what? A pat on the back? Moments of bliss that won't last? We'll come and go and suffer in the process while you, you'll be here for as long as this lighthouse stands? This is beautiful. This. At the center, a more ornately dressed corpse is wrapped by roots around its torso. A gray crown is laying at the left of its head. This is your, our throne. The body camera is released and falls to the ground. The feed is now obscured. Stretching and slithering are heard for approximately 12 seconds, then the sound of tightening and wet movement. The feed continues for another three hours. The only noticeable sounds are breathing. End log. Thank you for tuning in. We hope that you enjoyed this broadcast. If you did please subscribe, like and share it around. If you have any particular case files you'd like us to cover in future broadcasts leave a comment below and we'll get around to it shortly. Tune in again tomorrow for more revelations. Or